Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Sherry Kim, and welcome back to another episode of the Piano Star Masterclass brought to you by Piano League. During the live stream, you can ask us any questions in the chat, and we will do our best to answer them. You can also sign up to be a performer for these masterclasses and get a chance to perform for our live audience. Additionally, be sure to also check out our newest virtual competition, the Piano Star International Competition for students ages 18 and under. The deadline is actually this Sunday, October 25th. So today's guest teacher, Sandra Tamim, is on the faculty of the Manhattan School of Music Pre-College and the Cali School of Music at Montclair State University. She was also the former faculty teaching associate for the late Constant Keen at the Manhattan School of Music. She is also the co-director of the annual Dorothy Talman Festival at Montclair State University since 2011. And today she will be discussing the Talman approach and how to use it to progress through repertoire. It's an honor to have you on the show, Sandra. Here, it's such a privilege to be part of your organization. Yay. And I feel like the vision that you established with Piano League gives pianists an online community. And I feel that education on the internet suddenly is making the world of pianists come together. It really is for sure. Yeah. Yes. And, and, you know, we just want to be able to, you know, share our different stories, our different passions. And it, we especially love seeing what teachers are passionate about. And so on that note, I wanted to ask you, uh, how did you get into the Taubman, the Taubman approach and why has it become basically your thing? Okay. So I always heard about the name Dorothy Taubman. Uh, some of my colleagues at Manhattan School were studying on the side with her. Yeah. And then um, also when I went to Juilliard for graduate school, kind of heard the name a lot. And then it just happened that before I was going to do my debut, um, I had a funny incident where one of my brothers was writing pop songs and the agent for his pop songs was Dorothy Taubman's brother-in-law. He was a lawyer wow. for the arts. So that's how I met Mrs. Taubman. It was kind of an odd incident. And then I was very curious. In the beginning, I, I can't say that I was doubting it, but I was like, is this the decision that I want to do? And um, the more that I got to know the work, the more I was totally um, almost, I could say, mesmerized by how logical it was. And um, it wasn't something that she really invented. It was something that she was a, a free spirited person, but she was always looking to solve problems. And her own teacher, whose name was Jacob Hellman, who was Russian and had um, done a lot of research basically about the vertical sound of a key and produced a very um, succinct book, 80 pages, that's called The Consciously Produced Piano Tone, Most Natural Approach to the Problem of Artistic Piano Playing. And it's very wordy, but he did have a concept of the vertical speed of a key. And that kind of got her, I suppose, thinking about how to play. I so see. that was my story, yes. That's so interesting. Um, I, I think you mentioned before when we were talking that there was this quote that you had from yes, her. Did, I, I don't know if you want to share that. That's right, because as you know, there's no book. Everybody's anxious to know about a book, but she okay. did write hundreds of pages and they were done at a manual typewriter with the assistance of her husband. So she wrote this and it's about students. And I quote, all too often when students fail technically, it is assumed it is a lack of talent. When students complain of pain, they're told it's good for them, that it's necessary for the development of muscles. My research has shown that pain is always a warning that something's wrong. I saw that the relationship of the piano teacher and student differed from those in other fields in a very important way. Whereas often open debate is encouraged in other fields, piano students rarely question the instructions given them. 
Rather than have the students follow blindly, instructions should be given with explanations that stand up to reasoned challenge. This would encourage an awareness of what works for each student and damage would be avoided or eradicated. End of the quote. Wow, that's that's great. And it seems like now you've adopted what she preaches. And uh, would you like to just tell us a little bit about like what you've learned through teaching and kind of like your special niche in terms of teaching students? Sure. Um, my niche, I could say, is that somehow I've taken these concepts and I enjoy, I feel challenged by solving a difficult spot in, uh, in a piece. And I almost am intrigued to be told spontaneously, oh, it's like the, the coda of such and such a ballad of Chopin. And there's just this one phrase that just doesn't seem comfortable. And then I kind of go into this uh, you could say, basket of 10 concepts that she had and try to figure out which ones are necessary in that particular place. So that's what I enjoy doing. I mean, I did have wonderful mentors, I must say. I, I studied with, I was in the last class of Rosina Levine at Juilliard. And with, you mentioned Constance Keene, but my main teacher in Manhattan School is Doris Aslowski, who was also phenomenal. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I like doing. And so when you mean finding like little uh, places to work on you, you're talking about the technical side of fixing. Yeah, well, it's kind of interesting that you ask that because the big thing that Taubman always said was the reason, reason she started searching for solutions was to make beautiful music. Mm -hmm. And she felt that everybody's born with what it takes that if you if you have the right tools it's going to lead you to feeling like you can have beautiful tone and facility got it and it's just when i show some of the basic rudiments and in all honesty it's really hard to fit this into a 30 minute segment because i mean you have a whole festival about I, this yeah. right and i teach a course at, at montclair it's going to be in the seventh year i believe where it's only the Taubman approach. So every week it could be a different concept, like one week octaves, another week could be uh, right. leaps, another one is going to be shaping. Yeah. So this wow. is just the glimmer and a taste into um, what I think is really magnificent work. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we have like less than 30 minutes, so maybe we can go right into some of the examples that you have for us today. Yeah. I'd like to tell you first a little bit about the instrument. Got it. Okay. So Taubin felt that if you didn't know the instrument, that you are at a little bit of a loss. And the main thing that she said, even though we have 88 keys, is that you have to understand gravity and the control and balance of putting a key down. That if I hold a key, for example, I'm taking A, and I hold this key down, and then I try to drop my weight on the key, I can just hear without the sound of the key, if I'm really, really falling with intensity, with a fast speed, it's going to be a very sharp sound. Interesting, yeah. Now I'm going to go a little slower, and you're not going to hear that bang at the bottom. Then I'm going to go even lighter, as though I'm going to be playing softly, and then I can almost tell without having the key sound the different varieties of what's there. Now, what is very interesting is that a lot of pianists have not had the opportunity to learn that the key actually has this depression resistance feeling. And if you try several keys, if your piano is regulated, you feel that there's something like a bump and a little bit of a choke up, you could say, or something like that. And this is actually what's called the escapement by piano technicians. So Taubman actually named this point of sound where you feel like there's a little bit something stopping the depression to get to the key bed. She called it the point of sound. So I have to actually aim for the point of sound and the point of sound is a beautiful definition for it because that's actually where the hammer and the damper are depressing 
simultaneously on the string and getting the vibrations. So many times you see students playing something and after they get to the key bed, they might be scrubbing the key and it almost seems as though what they're doing is they want more tone to happen, but it's finished. So the only time that I'm going to actually have different key spots is if I have to go in to play a black thumb, something of that sort. So it's very important that we understand about the key itself. So if you've never experienced that little bump in the key and the feeling, try it after the session and then remember what exactly is happening. That that's the moment when sound is created. The other thing that she said was we have to know how to sit. Mm, that's true. Yeah. I mean, she, she did a lot of research and she felt that maybe when Glenn Gould was younger, he was sitting at a, what she would consider a proper height. So she said, it's so easy. You don't have to buy anything. All you need is a volume that's going to fit at the key lip and meet this bottom part of the fallboard. So all I do is I put it there. If I'm sitting at the right height, the underside of my forearm will rest on the book. If I'm sitting too high, as you can see, I'm exaggerating, but there's no connection with the top of the book. If I'm sitting too low, it's gonna push the book down and I might break at the wrist, okay? So you might say, question, if I'm tall, should I sit low? If I'm short, should I sit high? So the answer to this whole thing of what's the right height is a little subtle because yes, you have to feel it, but it's the relationship of your forearm, whether it's short compared to your entire body. I sit on the higher side. If it's long compared to your entire body, then you're going to be sitting higher. Okay. Got it. Lower, I always say, because little kids are closer to the ground. So if it's shorter, it's closer to the ground. So those are two important setups. Okay. Got and it. And then after that, she said, you also have to know, and this is something that I've kind of built extra onto, is you have to know how far, now I'm at the right seat height, how far should my torso be from the keyboard? And is my torso always going to be the same? So the answer is no. Your, your upper body is like a kinetic pendulum, okay? And it depends where you play. So if I'm going to experience what I think is a good thing, and you can be creative with any chords that you want, but I like to see where am I with a black thumb? So I'm going to take E flat major. Okay, so I'm feeling like that kind of Rubenstein picture look. It's like years ago. It's like he's smiled and he had this kind of a open arm feeling. He leaned back. I need to have my lever of the elbow. We'll talk about that in a moment. But here I feel as though I can lean back. If I'm going to go to play the same chord, let's say I can do it simultaneously or I can do it at another time, but it's one hand at a time. I'm going to have to lean in, okay? So I'll do the right hand. I lean back. I'm going to the next one, slightly forward, even more forward. And what's happening is my finger key spots are changing too. If you've never done it, try it, and you'll see that it's very interesting. Here the thumb is closer to my torso. Here, almost the same, and I'm staying straight with myself. If I stayed straight with the keys, then I would be over here and I'd be pulling on my upper arm with a pain in the back of my shoulder. So instead, I'm straight with myself. Now my thumb is closer to the fallboard and here really close. So it's completely reversed itself. And here I'm further in and then I'm out. So that's another important Taubman aspect. And I think all these little subtle things are sometimes taken for granted. Of. You start to play and you want to know how to do everything. No, good point. I, I feel like even for professional pianists, we don't normally think about these microscopic details about how our body moves. But I think it's for no matter where you're at in your piano journey, I think it's such an important reminder 
or maybe introduction. Right. To, and the yeah. amazing thing is that when everything's working right, it's invisible. Yeah. Just like the Maté book, you know, right. the visible and the invisible. It's just the, you watch a great artist. You can name any of them if you want to say Argerich, Strifanoff, Polini, you know, Barenboim, Axe. I mean, it just looks like they're they're not working very hard. Right. What comes out is amazing. Yeah. So that's that's why um, one other thing I want to stress before I get to the details. Taubman said, if things are working, don't take them apart. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah. Don't undo things. You know, you might have a little student and it just seems like the only thing you see is that the fingers are really clenched. I'm going to get to that as one of my first things. Got it. But everything else they do is so musical, like they shape, they feel the music, the rhythm is good, the balance is good. So maybe you just want to touch a little bit on that point, but leave everything else alone. Mm -hmm. And that's why she said, you know, the prodigies are the ones that you notice, like when they're so young. Right. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so there's something that's intuitive by nature. And that's what we're trying to do. Yes, for okay. sure. Yeah. Cool. So. The next thing that I'd like to um, talk about is the synchronization of the unit. Okay. Okay. The unit is actually um, the referral that Taubin said of what you need to use to play. So you've got your fingers and that's number one. That's like, that's the first commandment. Okay. You've got to have your fingers. They're so active. And then you've got your hand which is kind of like a tunnel to get to the fingers and you've got the forearm. Yes, you use the upper arm, but it's muscles are slower and it's just assisting. Okay. Got it. So it's like, this is the lever. Okay. okay. And actually she would say that in front of your body, you can turn it as though you were, let's say without grabbing a doorknob, it's the same reflex that you use all the time, but don't, grab with the fingers okay just feel like your arm has your fingers by the side just the way you take a walk. so it, it shouldn't look like this like this no claw curved. just mm -hmm. okay yeah okay so then as i walk by human nature we supinate which means that we tilt toward the pinky so very often when kids take this unit see so i'm in front of my body and it's almost like you could say i'm at nine o'clock and three o'clock i like using the clock i think that kids are always like into like what it looks like and then i take that nine o'clock and three o'clock and i just kind of go until i'm going to get to noon and then i could just put myself over five keys five fingers five keys oh interesting okay so this is my unit so it's almost like for kids there are numeral things you could say, numerous things you could say is like my fishing rod something like that but like the main that. thing that we want to do before we get to the clementi is that you want to understand that the unit is very free but the unit as we work you're going to see needs some motivation to get across the keys and in and out shaping the curvilinear motions and interdependence of the hands and the octave has a different posture we'll see that in Rachmaninoff and so the next thing we have to know and Taubman was very clear to say that you there are very few muscles that we need to know the free flexors those are our friends the flexor muscles is letter f it's like free fall fingers <laughs> And you can That's just go from the main knuckle, it's almost like a, a bird, and I don't have to take it past one and two. Okay. Ready? Yeah, it's almost like a, a chirping bird. Yeah. Okay. So the fingers fall freely, and they really have to fall together. So when I'm going to fall together, for example, when I'm going to play in a, in a uh, passage, for example, if I'm on the second finger, and I want to go to three, four and five have to also be sympathetic and say, I want to do that too. Got it. So, like a team. Exactly. Okay. Got it. So it's the flexor free fall. Fingers can fall and kind of copy the player. Okay. But the problem is we have an opposing muscle that's called an extensor. 
it's kind of like E for exit, like get out of here. And the, ex the extensor muscles lift us. Okay. And we could fight nature, but it's not going to help. The sad story of Robert Schumann's piano career is all because we can't fight nature. So what happens is the fourth finger can't work as well. If I play, for example, lifting a second finger, and we don't want to isolate. This is the point, but I'm showing you why first. Okay. Two lifts, three lifts okay, four is completely feeling paralyzed, and five is skinny and lifts because by nature, we're born with what's called ligamentous tissue. And it's sewn in our um, physiology over the third and the fifth fingers. So it makes it impossible for the four to have the height. But with this rotation, if I play, for example, second finger, and then I initiate from the elbow very subtly, and I swing back to play down to the four, it's really strong. And I can do it in the reverse direction. Now, if you notice, all the fingers are following it, and they all feel this natural curve, okay? So that, in a nutshell, is exactly what we need to know. There are two other muscles, and the one is the abductor, and that means that I'm going to stretch out. Now, you can stretch out if you have a freedom of the main knuckle here at the bridge. You can stretch out. But if you keep the bridge very tight and try to stretch out, you can see it looks like I developed two claws instead of two hands. So it's important to understand that these abductor muscles are not the friendly ones for the fingers, except it is for the thumb. Okay? Yeah. And then we have the adductor muscles, which are like adding bundles, like for math, for kids. So we have the adductor muscles, which bring our fingers close which might be good in a passage where you have to go one, four, three, two, one, four, three, two. But our fingers really don't like that. And the other thing she didn't like was this concept of tuck the thumb. And I'll show you why. If I move the thumb along, like I said, like the chirping bird to the second finger, okay, it doesn't feel as though anything's going wrong. It feels great. It's yeah. just a natural instinct thing. Just like I'd go to get my pencil, okay? So that's okay. But once I put the thumb to tuck in a scale underneath three, I'm locked. See, mm -hmm. try my fingers down. And they can't because the thumb is really in the way of the free fall. So that's another thing so that when we do it, we really just do, for example, in the Clementi, we can open the score of the Clementi now. Sure. So in the Clementi, we're really going to feel as though when I go to the pentascale, which is in measure two, my pentascale happens to be right there. So when I go to this, I'm going to feel as though if I had to do my five fingers in a row, it's probably the hardest thing you can do. I'm first going to just bring my hand up and put my hand over the five fingers. Now, I'm going to exaggerate, but you see where my long fingers are, two, three, and four? Yeah. yeah. They're covering black keys. So small children don't cover them that much because their hands are tiny. So what happens is they start playing and they might have a nice curve. Might be a little bit tight, but it doesn't seem like it's going to cause a problem. And as you develop longer fingers and start growing up, what happens is if I play with a thumb and no in and out motion, I'll do thumb on fa, and then suddenly I'm exaggerating, but the fingers will suddenly tighten up and spasm. Hmm. And the only reason is because thumb decided it's going to be on a key and the other fingers want to play. Why not? So really this is the place where key spots come in where I was showing you before, like the different like locations, if I just let my thumb allow two different spots, like one and two, two, just go to the middle of the key and then you're gonna be okay. 
I mean, there are a lot of subtleties that I can't get into tonight because of the time restriction. But if I do one and then I rotate single rotation to the second and I just feel like I want to get to that spot, it's okay. But if I play my thumb and then I isolate finger movements and just kind of clench to get out to the white keys, that's when everything happens to make the technique fall apart. And also, if I only play with my fingers, if I play, for example, with my third finger, and you can tell very easily if you're teaching because there's no subtle movement of left to right in the wrist area. Okay, so if I see this very subtle movement in the wrist area, even though it's initiating at the elbow, I can tell that the unit is alive. So that's really a very important focus when I'm playing the Clementi. Now, the left hand is simply single rotations. And the easiest way to say single rotations is for rotations in opposite directions. So I could tell a child, right, left, right, left. But it's all I'm doing is almost as though I would be dribbling a ball or mixing a batter or drawing circles. It's like some continuous motion. What happens in the opening of this piece is that we don't really know. Maybe Clementi used the fingering five, three, one, and then played the three spunky little staccatos. <laughs> we don't know. If he did that, then the notes are right under your hand. But if most editions uh, have now, as though it's a broken chord, so I have to use this walking hand and arm which is actually like her third element. I talked about rotation in and out and the walking hand and arm. The walking hand and arm means that the previous finger is not gonna stay behind. It's almost as though, sometimes I say to somebody, if you had to take the crumbs off the table, okay? So with, with a sponge or with a towel, I'm moving, I'm moving. And here for the second finger, I didn't have to do anything because I had my major third, but from two to one, I have to do something or I'm going to twist because you see here I have the second finger in the middle of the key and my thumb desperately wants to play. So if I don't move in on the second finger before the thumb very slightly, then I'm going to have an abrupt jolt and you're going to see this turning. Okay. You might say, ah, oh, people don't do it. Well, carpal tunnel syndrome happens right here, usually underneath the thumb at the wrist because of this twisting motion. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's really important to, even if you would take this first measure and then just separate those two notes to just kind of get the feeling. You can even go backwards and then just put it together. Don't make a big deal about anything. The thing about the scale, and there could be um, a whole topic of its own, but the thing about the scale is it's actually in the second measure. Do and Re and Fa and Sol are the same single rotation. So if I just have the crossover for the three, one, two, and think of it that, it's really literally the three is a double rotation because it's copying the direction of the two. Okay. okay. So, but look how easy. I'm not going to get into that million intricacies, but <laughs> quite easy. And then you have the pentascale. What yeah. I like to do with this piece before we go to for release is I like to have a kid make a story, a child make a story. So it could be, oh, we're out at the park. Okay. Climb down the jungle gym. And this is like hopping in place. Where do you also hop in place? Measure three. And then measure four. And then when it gets soft, when you play staccato thirds, you only have to put the key down because you know how I was explaining before? The key has this elastic kind of resilience. Right. So a lot of times kids see staccato and it's like hot oven. <laughs> and they feel they feel almost like a, a tightness because they're they're going up and down it's like if you go like this a lot without even playing the piano after a while you're tired even though it's doable 
And if you do rotation, it's so much easier. But if you think in one direction for staccato, okay? Just down, down, down. And don't lose the surface. It's almost like uh, a trampoline effect. And very important over here because the left hand musically says, so fa me, so fa me. So the left is instigating and la so, and then grouping. I'm grouping from the top note because then everything it's like it's like a domino effect from the top. one kids get very scared of these two measures i'm going to take it apart into group remember the left is the boss musically look what the right hand has how do you like that so it's like if this child sees that then all i need is the melody on top of that that's one group the next group is going to go from black to white, which is usually the way we'd group if we had a decision instead of white to black. Now, the end of this measure, if I'm going from a second beat, is measure five. But it just has a left hand going with it. Finish. Wow. So, grouping. So, now we've already gotten on to everything we didn't shape yet. We're going to do that in fur lease. But you saw many elements that really are the tools of Taubman. And I only put them where I need them. Yes, that's, that's a lot. And that was just, you know, the exposition, half of the exposition. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I'm moving on to Fur Elise. And the reason that I chose um, Fur Elise is because it has another element. Remember, we were talking about the interdependence. So the hands have to cue each other and organize so that their reflexes will just feel like one has an idea that the other one is kind of instigating and follows through. So it's one kinetic feeling at the end. It's okay. an experience. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the introduction, but I use, usually make a joke with students because this is for Elise, okay? It actually is a bagatelle, and we know that it wasn't um, published until 40 years after he died, but he had a girl he liked, obviously, who was Elise. So here's E for her name, E, E, E. And obviously, I'm not going to play it like that, but that's a grouping for students, right? Three, one, two. So it's actually three E's. Okay. Right. And now here I'm going to shape. I'm going to shape the design under and over. And you might say, well, Sandra, how did you know the right shape? Usually our bodies will do the right shape. Because if I did this, and instead of going over, under, and then complete the over, if I went instead of that, I went under, over, and the reverse, <laughs> it looks really, yeah, it looks right. laughable, and it's not fun. Then the other main event in this piece is this cueing. So when I get to the second measure, I have to tell myself, these are some clues for kids that I think generally teaching overlooks. Oh, look what I have on the downbeat, two A's. I have an A on the second beat. And then I'm going to have the A, Q, the C. So that is almost as though the left hand said, I finished my A's, and now you start with the C. And then my left has to get ready. And again, the G sharp to the E, get ready. So many times, the rest is our friend. We don't want to rush, but it's our friend to get someplace. The same thing happens in the C major. And you can think how many notes are in the group, but I think this cueing is the interdependence, the main thing about this piece. The first hard place for students after they've gotten that done, and don't forget, left is still the boss, even with the broken octaves. Here's one group and a second group. And then the left is the boss on the chromatic. 
you have to decide who's the boss in a way. Okay. But yet they merge into one feeling. The hard place is this little transition second ending. So I have to get my right hand ready, but I'm going to look for that clue. Just like on the measure two, I said, ah, two A's on the downbeat. Oh, look what I have here. Okay. So like I say, I'm putting together Taubman ideas. I didn't have a lesson on this with her, but it's just, I'm thinking that logically this helps. And what do the other voices do? So I have a little of this contra motion. And that will make it easier. There's only one other kind of place that balance is always an issue. And I think it's almost, it's on um, the repeated A section. Measure 60. So most editions, like this just happens to be... Um, from a Suzuki book level seven, most editions have two choices of fingering, which makes a lot of sense. If you want to do single rotation, two, one, two, one, two, one, then you're going to have a change on every beat. Two, one, two, one, two, one. If you prefer three, two, one, you're going to have two groups per measure. Whenever I do that, I have to start with a longer finger closer to me and then work in. That just stops the crowding and clenching kind of feeling. And most importantly, that I'm going back to the very first concept I told you about understanding the key. Yeah. And, and that weight of the key. If I release and let it pop up and let the key rest, it's very difficult to control the softness and the speed. It will be very easy if you just think of it, it's almost like a, an elastic rebound, okay? Yeah. I'm only thinking down. Okay. So that's that's what I would learn from that. And in our last piece, the Rachmaninoff, the famous C-sharp minor prelude. So actually the concepts for this one are the octaves in the opening, the leaps, and the fingering and enslavement. Those were the rest of her concepts. Okay. Enslavement is the big thing here, but we have to open with the cadence 451, which is bells, Moscow bells. And if anybody worked with Taubman, they knew that bells were her, her favorite kind of imagery. So what I have is a triplicate when I play an octave because my fingers can't stretch to reach the octave if I keep the main knuckle. Again, it looks like a claw. But if I, she used to use the word comb out the main knuckle and then my main fulcrum or my main support becomes the wrist. And if you watch, especially women pianists whose hands have to compromise a little bit for the stretch of eight notes, you'll see that this isn't something that somebody, for example, if you watch fabulous octaves of Yu Zhou Wang, she wasn't taught by Dorothy Taubman, but this is instinctively the successful posture for that. With the rotations always going toward the thumb for, for octaves and chords, even if it feels straight. So I'm gonna have different posture in my hands. This one is kind of wipe out the knuckles because it has the octave and the right hand has the support of the main knuckle and I feel the flexing. So that's the octave trick of the opening and you can play without hitting and banging onto the bottom of the key. You can slow the key down and have the pedal down even before you start. It's something I learned as a child from Edwin Hughes. Put the pedal down before you start the piece. There's no law that says you couldn't. That works in many different pieces. So here we get to that other problem, the last one. Enslavement to notation is kind of a funny topic. It sounds like you've got chains on you, but in a way you do. So she said, after you finish the last octave, for theoretical reasons, Rachmaninoff was thinking that he had to play root position in the right hand. it too loud but just to explain to you now so what happens this way is it's different notes and it's got crossing thumbs and so it's like as you're playing it's almost like oh 
where do I have to go? Where do I have to go? So she said, hmm, wonder if it's going to work. If I uncross the thumbs, what am I going to come up with? Here we go. The same notes in both hands. Wow. Even later. And the same thing when I have it. So that's uncrossing the thumbs. You might okay. say, huh, I don't know about that. But this is kind of a funny aside that I had a student years ago from Europe, and this was the music. And the music shows you that this particular oh, edition wow. uncrossed it and actually gave the chords analyzation. So you can't say, huh, I don't think I'm doing that because someplace in this world, people have thought of that maybe before she did. Wow. The last two things I wanna discuss before we go to masterclass, the agitato, very interesting, again, I'm always looking to see where was the melody, where is it continuing. In the first measure of, of agitato, remember the melody. Look at this. We've got the left hand is the, the tonic, and then and then a little triplet B sharp. Here, if I think about that fingering trick. I have five, It feels wonderful, okay? And in the left hand, I put two on my black A sharp. The last place on this page is, if, if you've taught this piece, students say, oh no, what do I do? I'm really scared about, I don't think I can play that broken, interval it's really hard for me so talman said that whenever you have a broken interval get the interdependence from the previous hand of the opposite hand of the other measure before so here the measure before i'm going like this I play normally, but my left hand is kind of like getting a preparation as though it's a grace note from the previous measure. And if I want to go faster, I'm still thinking that it's uh, from the previous measure. I see. The very last place is this interplay on 35. If the hands are kind of virtuosic, even if it's, you're gonna lose it. So take Rachmaninoff's gift he's giving you. The right can seem like it's free to play the chords, but the left has to stay because it's the locator. See this G sharp thumb is gonna be the locator for the right hand A and it's chromatic. And then the pattern starts again. Right hand leads. But there's a sense of cueing, and their four little patterns make the phrase. So these are subtleties. Once you know how to do it, my mind's on the music. I'm not like, oh, better keep that hand down. But they're little gems, I feel. And a lot of times, like it was in her quote, People are frustrated because maybe they're embarrassed. The teacher's very famous, or the teacher they think expects them to know the piece after two, three lessons. So I just have a sense that if you have a glimmer of this work, you can almost solve things with um, logic and thinking about the music because the music is what's really giving you the answer. Wow, that was a plethora of information. That's awesome. Thank you so much again for giving us just concrete examples through these uh, three pieces. And now we, as we move on to the master class, we'll have even more examples that you'll be sharing with us. So we're looking forward to that for sure. Thank you, Sherry. 
So basically, we're going to be moving on to that portion now. Um, we actually have Kira backstage with us. Um, she'll be playing for us Chopin's Nocturne in C sharp minor. And I'm going to bring her in right now. Hi, Kira. All right, so I'm going to be backstage and I'll let you guys work on this together. Great. Hi, Kira. Go ahead. I guess since March, right? Yeah. Good for you. So I wanted to actually probably spend most of the time on just the opening. And then when the time signature changes from two, four, and then into the three, four, and um, then the closing page with the kind of cadenza, beautiful kind of vocal coloratura you know, like amazing runs. So I wanted to ask you first, because it seems like you set the mood very beautifully. Did you have a sense of what was going on at night in this nocturne? Or do you 
uh, what, was there something that kind of tied together the intro with the theme? Um, I kind of just thought like, you know, people sort of waltzing slowly under some moonlight. Good for <laughs> you. Okay, that could work, sure. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do is this. I like the opening and it's always a question for musicians when a composer says things twice. And I remember it's kind of a funny thing, but everybody has a different sense of humor. So Mrs. Talman in a master class, uh, they were um, two week festivals up in Massachusetts in Amherst College and then Williams College. So she would very often use talking on the telephone for repetition. And she'd say something like, hello, hello. And she'd say, you know, it's human nature. It's almost like if you saw nowadays on caller ID, somebody you really can't wait to talk to, it's like, hello. And then you see caller ID, it's like somebody you really rather not talk to, maybe like, hello. Okay, so the thing is that Chopin said the same thing twice. And he just didn't pick those notes. He's got a reason for them. So I wanna go over how you did it nicely, but how you might think about it as you play this piece in years to come. So the downbeat, the first beat, has a C-sharp minor first inversion, and he's got the root there. Then he says he's going to move to more C sharps. See what I mean? But the melody is going T. And then he takes a little breath, and then he says, Oh, I love chromatic because that's kind of intrigue, right? Get it? Yeah. So now, what I wanted to do, because we never actually did this, I searched around and I said to myself, Hmm. Why is it that introduction with the first three notes on the melody line? Does he ever use it again besides on the repetition? So I looked in the beginning of the theme. I can see it. All I saw was that he, he ended that phrase with a C sharp minor. So it's kind of like the reverse of the opening. Agree? Yeah. I'm still searching. It's like a, a puzzle. Now I come to um, the measure where I think measure seven, I might find the answer to what I'm looking for. Aha, I see for the first time a dotted rhythm. But now I see, aha. Where did I hear those notes before the triplet? Aren't they like in diminution or a faster point of tom? Yeah. Yeah. So isn't that amazing? I mean, the man was such a genius and he lived just only 39 years. So when you come to that place, I, what I thought, it's almost like he's requesting that he wants more volume there. So when you get to the theme and you get to that measure seven, what I think you could do, you did it beautifully. For the polyrhythm, you completely did the cueing part when you did together, and then you had the right, left, right. But I'd like to almost feel like you could expand in the volume more there. Okay? Now, another thing that I liked what you did, but I'm going to share it with the audience. So when you go to music school, you have to really pay attention to this stuff. Because if you have a, a renowned teacher, they might say, so um, do you remember you're playing from memory? What's the dynamic marking on the theme? Okay, your music's supposed to be closed. Well, I don't know. So is there a dynamic marking for the theme? Um, no. Yeah, you got the right answer. Good for you. So what does he say he wants? Legato, connected, so it's like a voice. Okay. 
And what's the word in between the treble and bass clefs? Legato. I have another word. Don't forget the two editions of this. There is his sister. It was, this piece was dedicated to his sister as, quote, I took the quote because I found it online, quote, an exercise before studying the second concerto. We'll get to that. But there are two editions. One is his sister's and the other one, which Henley now prints, which is his edition. Because as we know, posthumous, meaning that this was published actually in 1870, way after he died. So my edition says Dolce. Does yours say Dolce on the theme? No. Okay. But yours doesn't say Forte or Piano or Mezzo Piano, does it? Yeah. So we're both on the same mental process. We both know now that when you play this theme, you want it to sound sweet. Like you said, it could be like people dancing in the evening, it's kind of bittersweet, okay, whatever's their life story. But we want to make sure that we don't kind of mute our potential, okay? So the, what I like that you did, because I remember at one point when we were doing the shape of the left hand, it's very often that students will almost feel like they have to play one of the left hand notes as they shape the, the design with the walking hand and arm. You did it very well because you didn't make it bump out. But sometimes students will play. And a note will just kind of bump out. So I think you solved that because you are literally almost touching the key tops and feeling like your forearm and palm were helping along. But what I'd like you to feel, and you can experiment with it, is that the opening has a sense of something awesome the second time around, and that when you come to the theme, that is almost free range of colors, especially when, in a way, he wanted the audience to hear ya da dum which is and instead of the chromaticism on the theme because this as you know is like a, a morton idea so is the trill here and then the little ending okay would you want to just try, let's just go through like the first seven, eight measures, and then we're going to go to the transition section. repeat of the intro is maybe softer and linger before the F double sharp or play the F double sharp with more intensity and then linger and close off. And actually when it comes to this interpretation it's nothing that you can keep drilling 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 and it's gonna be the same. It's almost like yesterday wasn't the same as today. Right? Didn't have a big event last night, probably. And the thing is that music is so fluid, so it almost depends on how you feel about it, but you know in your brain you want variety. I liked what you did with the theme, it's beautiful. Just make sure that when you go to the two C sharps, trying to be the highest notes. And then if you look, he doesn't have high notes until you get to the first cadenza with 
the triplet. So there's something to be said for the intensity of the measures that have the triplet. And it all started out there in seven. That's why I'm kind of drilling on the point. Get what I mean? Yeah. And then that one that I just played for you, measure 15, that's an outburst because my score says conforza. Does yours? Yeah. Good. So if you say something with force, it's just, for example, something like, I really can't go there. Not, I really can't go there. So you can take even a little bit more time on the downbeat than the first T. And maybe unwind at the end, okay? So it's almost like, I like everything you're doing, but don't be afraid to exaggerate here and there some of those ideas. Then we keep going, and I have to compliment you that after you finished the first section and you went into A major, I could, I could sense a different mood. I'm still talking about triplets. That's kind of like the extra something that we hadn't spoken about. You see that measure, A major? Mm -hmm. What do you see rhythmically there? Um, quarter note, and sixteenth, and triplet. And then that triplet. triplet, yay! Okay, so even though it's soft, it's like he didn't have that triplet, for example. Measure 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. He didn't have it in 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. All of a sudden, 21 A major. So you want to almost feel like that they don't match. Like da 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 dum, di da da dum. And I have to tell you a little cute story. If I told it to you in another lesson, um, I'll just tell the audience. I had a teacher, and it wasn't my piano teacher, but at Manhattan School, I had a teacher. And I believe it was um, keyboard uh, studies, reading chorales and things like that. And I can still picture his face. And he used to say to us, if you can say it, you can play it. If you can sing it, you can play it. So I would say there's nothing embarrassing. Sometimes I ask students, for example, advanced talented students, can you count it out loud while you play? And they're like, Mm, I know the counts, and they're all great in math. I can't do that, okay? So sometimes for the flow of the music on this pianissimo, I loved what you did. If you want to make it really special, maybe you have to sing. Maybe you're going to say, oh, I want more time on my 16. Okay? You can fool around with it, but it kind of gives you an idea of how it would be sung. I'm sure you did that when we go to the measure that has the first little grace note. Because we worked that out, and the same thing happens on Because many times students play grace note like it's a 16th. It's a little flourish. He's going like, ta-da. <laughs> right? Okay. So now let's go on. And there were a couple other triplets and the <laughs> And then he finishes on the forte. Right? And then pianissimo. And here comes the triplet. So we almost could say, like, fool around with this, at, uh, like, on your own, but almost like you want the measures with the triplets to make sure that they don't go da da da, but more and less, like he said there, or sometimes less and more, like he says, for example, in the measure 21. Something interesting happens, and I like the idea that you said a dance at night, because when I get to the 2-4, four, 
Okay, I know something's gonna happen. So, it's almost like, hmm, key change, uh, change of time signature. So that's a transition. That must have meant a lot to, to Chopin as a composer because he wanted to get into this, this idea of the triplet because as I mentioned in the history of the piece, that's a theme in the second concerto. And he was only 21 when he wrote this piece. It's amazing, right? So I like the way you did the transition, but let's think about what happens besides that change of time signature right you were in four four then he goes to two four to kind of put the brakes on and then he goes to three four so a three four with an accent on one could be a waltz this doesn't have an accent accent on one it doesn't go it doesn't so this is almost like a flashback of another kind of dance. I think it's a mazurka. That's a Polish dance with an accent on two or three. So what I think we have to also look at, because this is one element that we never talked about, is that triplet that started back in measure seven. This is the first time I was doing like this whole search up until now did you see a triplet in the left hand until you get to the three, four measure? No. I didn't either. So I think in a way, by putting that triplet in the left hand, it creates the dance of the mazurka or a different mood, whatever you want to think of. It could be that they just did a different step in their nocturnal like dance that they did. Okay? But when you have... And then soft suddenly. And then what we did was we shared the hands, right? And I like the way you did it a lot. Do you have on um, measure 35 any accent? No. Okay. So this edition, which is, you know, it's kind of interesting that we both have the two only available editions. So mine has an accent on the second beat of 35. So I was thinking what you might want to do, because he says after there, sempre più diminuendo, right? Yeah. So why don't you try from, let's say, 35, when you have... the one that has the B sharp with the dotted quarter on the second beat, can you make that a little bit of a more important measure than the following one? So there's a little bit of variety and as you go you're going to get softer and softer and softer. So I'm just showing you a little bit of variety, and that somehow made the two measures feel like they were one motivic design. I like that. It didn't kind of just sound like we're playing triplets and triplets in the left hand and triplets and triplets, okay? It just had a sense of the two bars become kind of unified into one dance step. Now, one thing that I felt and let's take a look at this, right where you stopped and there's the adagio. He, he has to transition back to the theme, the piece ABA. In the adagio, I love the poetry that you play, but I'd like to know, even though it's really slow and it's the first time he goes back to 4-4, could you tell me the value of these notes?
It's so, like uh, what are one of them is like a twelfth of a beat. Or no, sorry, it's a third of a beat. You're right. So that means hello, triplets back again. So we don't want to really accent this one because it's such a long winded beautiful it's almost like the curtain closed or if they were outside it's kind of like it got so cloudy out and the moon went behind the clouds so it's a different mood it's going to be pianissimo your dynamics were great and then he says morendo which means dying okay or maybe the person got so tired of dancing with that triplet that you just finished, which was much more upbeat. It just seems like that little section has more of like a, a kick to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'd like to feel, even though your mood is perfect, is there any way that you could just feel like So I don't feel like it's one and two and three and four and five and six and because it's not it's not six eight time okay try that excellent good for you now then the repeat comes back and the only place that we really should know that's different so that for memory purposes, we don't go back to the beginning of the piece because it has happened. It doesn't have to be a student. It can happen to famous artists that there's a subtle difference between a first time and a second time. What I'm talking about is measure 15. sharp the one right below middle c this one on the recap has the same left and right so i want to make sure that when you play this from memory that you feel as though you have that clear in your mind so you don't find yourself going back to e now, before we conclude, there was one place that I feel a little rushed, and that is the first cadenza that you have on measure 58. So you did it so well. We talked about how the high point notes on all of these cadenzas have a partner. Like in this case, it's the two D sharps, right? And the next one, we also have the two D sharps. The reason I'm picking on this particular measure was we're supposed to have a difference in how many notes are in the right. How many, many in the measure that I'm talking about, 58? How many in total? Hmm? 35. No, I mean the one before that. Uh, uh, 18. Yeah. Your 18 has to remember that some additions even have portamento coming down. Does yours? No. Okay. So that's just a little aside. But you have to remember that the left hand that you have for the 18 is the same one that you have for 35. So if you play the, the 18 fast, and then I heard something like this. Do you think your left hand was in the same tempo both times? No. <laughs> so this is what we want to try to perfect is the 35 is a little stretching it, but we want to try to make sure that if you'll be slower when you have 18, then your left will make 
maintain its tempo. And you'll sound more bravura on the 35. Okay. Want to try that? So feel really slow on measure 58 with 18. <laughs> that we got to do this. Great. Thank you, Kira. Hi, is the audio on? Yeah, for me it's on. Great. How are you, Jamie? I'm good, thank you. Great. Good to see you. Okay, so if you're comfortable, why don't you um, play through um, and then we'll go back. And I must say, I'm particularly proud of you having learned this just since the school year started and memorizing it. Because as I said with, with Kira, we haven't had in-person lessons for so long, but this is a very uh, recent piece. And it's kind of your first endeavor into the Spanish repertoire too, right? Okay. All right. So go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Really nice. Excellent. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this piece. And I remember when you selected this particular piece, I had told you to listen on YouTube to one or two other selections and you chose this. Okay. So um, why did you choose it? What do you like in particular about this piece? And what do you sense is um, the scenario that's going on? It's not a nocturne, okay? So what do you feel it is? I feel it is like someone is really singing and more uh, of the ABA format where two singers actually um, change on the stage. And it really interests me. Oh, okay. That's a nice concept. Okay. So I'm thinking um, about the title of the piece. And also it's very important, especially you're a junior in high school. It's very important for you, for students in general, to look up the history of a piece or look up the history of a composer and kind of get a sense, especially because it's a different culture. And the first thing is that although um, Granados did study, I believe, for two years in Paris, that he was a real nationalistic composer. He was so in awe of the art, Goya's art in particular, because he wrote the Goyescas. And he was so into the heart and soul of the um, local music of his country. And I agree with you. I think it is a singer. And I looked up something and they actually have what's called a vocal style of a flamenco dancer and singer. And it's called Canta Gondo, G-O-N-D-O. -O, but in Spanish, I think the G is pronounced with the A. Canta Gondo. So I think you're right on target with that. Now, don't forget that the sad thing about um, Granados is when he wrote this, he was, um, it was 1890. And um, he was born in 1867, okay? So he was still quite a young man. The sad thing is that he had been invited to come to United States. And then he was invited to visit the White House and changed his plans, how he was going to get back to Spain with his wife. And they had to um, go from England to France on a ferry. I think I might have mentioned the story. And the ferry was torpedoed by a German submarine. And he actually um, survived like just for maybe a couple minutes. But then when he realized his wife was in the water, he went to save her and they both drowned, which is very, 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 very heartbreaking. So uh, getting back to the story, it has a lot of emotion, right? What do you think is in the left hand? <laughs> like a guitar you strumming and maybe also like a tambourine or a percussion. Good. I totally agree with you. So actually in the one uh, favorite recording I have of this, which is Alicia de la Rocha, she's like the, the queen of all Spanish performers. And she studied with um, a man whose name was Frank Marshall. And Frank Marshall was a student of Granados. So it's like firsthand. When she plays the opening in the particular recording I heard, it's almost as though maybe castanets 
are happening with the guitar strum or maybe somebody's heel of their boot. It almost seems like she says, aha, this piece is in E minor. I want the audience to know it. So it's almost like she gives a fermata and a full forearm feeling. The fermata is just to enjoy the moment. But I think what we want to do in setting the character is physically, when I play the free fall, I really feel almost like you could experience this. First, free fall into your lap, almost like uh, I sometimes give this image. You don't have to be higher than this. A shy person in class, teacher, I have a question, but teacher doesn't choose you, but that's about how high you raise your hand. Not, hi, I know it, but you're here, right? Okay. So teacher, I have a question. Then from your elbow, just drop into your lap, almost like it smarts your lap, like it's kind of like a fast fall. Good, okay. Did you feel that reaction on, on, your, on your leg? Yes? yes? Okay. Now, if you want it slightly less, then you would just slow the motion. Taubin said it's just like it's the physics of it. You'd slow the motion, but still it's going to be teacher, I have a question. When you get to the second measure where it's already mezzo piano, could you almost feel like, oh, if I go too far off the surface of the keys, I might miss the note. So you're like a little closer. And then when you get into the third measure where it's tapering off and he says, I want it piano, could you really just be almost on top of the keys? Okay. So we have three different ways. If I were to just play it as an open fifth, Okay, the perfect fifth. And then the second one is closer, and then the third one. Okay, so I want that to come alive. And then, do you have any accents on these grace notes? Um, measure two, the uh, third string note. Yeah. Which beat on two? On uh, the second beat. Second beat? interesting because i have yeah. a popular edition i think we talked about this okay um and i don't have any accents but we both have the diminuendos right okay yeah. so physically i want you to almost give a little bit more like uh out and open and not like just kind of free to kind of set the mood okay Maybe it's a whole, like, four guitarists, okay? Then maybe it cuts down to two guitarists, and then it's one guitarist. It has to sound that... Okay? So you want that to kind of settle down. Now, I'd like you to try that without the right hand. Good. Okay. Now let's talk about because it's a grace note and a grace note that's going, it's actually what we would call in this case, because some editions might have the line through it. It could sometimes be referred to as an achakatora, but don't forget that it, it's a black note going to a white. So I want you to feel, especially in the opening, like that there's more emphasis on the thumb. And the thumb is elevated because Talbin used to call that a backward shift because you're coming back from the black level down to the white level, but you want it to feel in your hand like you're on the same level. It's a little bit of an oxymoron, right? But I want to hear So I can distinguish that the thumb is the beat note. And I don't want it to rush, especially when on the measure three when the right hand comes in. Because the singer, she's kind of like making a grand entrance. She probably has on this huge skirt and she's just not going to move too fast. She's center stage. She's probably got all kinds of like uh, 
jewelry and ornamental you understand she she wants to state something so i'd like it to feel the cueing was good when you had the beat in the left when you had four five six four five six because we were talking about this the left hand is the boss and this is that concept of interdependence right so you feel like left is the boss <laughs> So let's move on, but think about that idea so that it really seems as though it's natural to you. I felt almost like the dynamics now really were right, but I felt like the timing of this, it's almost like, uh, I don't think you're playing fast enough for the singer. You better kind of step up your tempo. It's almost like the reverse. She's walking on stage or maybe she's in, the, in a cafe or she's in the town square and everybody's got their eye on her because she's singing this. Now, so when you did the theme, what I thought you did very well, so take your time into the introduction. I like da, 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 da. But again, I was uh, thinking when a composer decides to play the same tone in the six beat measure three times B, B, B. why didn't he go hmm? he could have it would be i mean i'm not a composer so to speak but it would be pretty he's saying, I want you to hear. I want you to hear the fifth of that chord and I'm kind of emphasizing it. So I'd like you to feel that you have to make a decision and you don't have to stick with that decision every time, but you're gonna have, for example, the downbeat might be a subtle one because then he gives you a new slur you have that probably on your edition also a new slur on two correct yeah then four five six one two so i almost feel in the measure um four when you have the full theme that to make it sound more melancholy you have to be more sympathetic to syncopation okay you're excellent in math so i want you to lean on two and five and you might you might on the next measure go one two, The next time you might give more on one. But again, it's just like um, when I was talking in my lecture earlier, it's like when a note is presented in that measure and maybe that same measure uh, comes repeated another three bars later, be flexible in this style, okay? particularly it's very elastic okay so work on that idea what i want to do is now and it was a little bit in the transition of the um listening the connection was a little bit hard in one or two measures when i heard the d major so d major starts on measure nine so she's starting on a downbeat with the 16th notes. She never did that. She always did her 16th as an intro from the previous measure. Da, 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 da. And the B was a downbeat, it was an eighth note. And then the next measure, B is an eighth note. And then she repeats, okay? So D major, he's so clever and he has that, he's captured like the depiction of Spanish life. So he wants a new rhythm. So when he does the left hand, you were really good at that because I could even notice your elbow was flexible because if the elbow got locked where the pinky is, you wouldn't have, you, it would have been really difficult to get your thumb. 
So you, those kind of movements of the forearm combined with the hand and fingers, those are really, I think you've got them down very well. I also like the way you do the accompaniment on. It doesn't sound as though the accompaniment is interfering, not. Okay, some students have problem balancing it. Okay, so you, you went deeper beyond the point of sound and you really feel like you're on the key bed. And this one, the thumb is playing out, but then I wanted to hear in the measure 11 where suddenly it's a distorted syncopation out of the blue no longer does the left go one two three four five six even if it had a chaka torres he switched so i couldn't hear and honestly maybe it was in the transmission i couldn't hear enough of one, two, three, four, five, six. because suddenly the strumming guitar is the g played by the right hand and the left hand is the syncopated So could you start maybe on nine? Taking your time. Because you gotta take your time to kind of say to the audience, guess what? 30 second notes are here. Okay, try that. And then I wanna hear that 11 where you jolt the syncopation. It's almost like if, if somebody got, was, was caught off guard. Okay, try those four or five measures. Good. I like the sense of um, the uh, rhythm, but I felt that it was too hectic. I liked when you started one, two, three, four, five, eight, nine, 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 when he decided to give 30 second notes, he doesn't have new notes. Remember the three notes that introduced the lady's tune? Mi, fa, so, ya, da, 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 right? What are these 30 second notes? The same notes. It's almost like if you're talking to your friends and you say something like, see you later. And then you go, see you later. It's, you're saying the same words, but I couldn't really tell because I felt like this was too fast. With your time D major. Don't be shy to exaggerate. You're on the right track. We're going to go to a different place, but work on that because it it's not for example, if you were playing in a classical or Baroque style where somebody might say to you, you know, I can't feel the pulse of the piece. Okay. This is almost your big opportunity to be flexible and fluid and, and feel as though you're in, you know, that Southern region of Spain enjoying, you know, like the everything there. When you got to the octave section, Again, I think that physically that you were comfortable. I like the idea that you had a sense of um, very accented. And I just wanted to ask you if when you played loud, did you feel that you also did the one, two, two and five like we have in the beginning of the piece? And then this you did well. One, two, and then four, five. And then when I'm playing all these chords and you did them well, I just feel like my hand is kind of open and supported by the wrist because they're expansive. What I wanted to talk about was, do you feel like getting to the fortissimo on um, that uh, the measure? uh 22 do you feel that for the interdependence that 
the left hand moves sooner to get to the B. And remember, you rotate it and then move. Did you feel as though you got to the left hand and put the foot down as well in advance? Yes. Okay, good. So that's a very important concept because if I stay to the end, it feels hectic. Scary. Like I might miss something. So that's a very important point. And I liked very much, again, just exaggerate your retards, especially when you got into the E major. On the E major section, I like the way that that I could hear the soprano and it could be the same lady or it could be another lady who is her friend and um, uh, is singing a different song. But I have the word leggeramente, do you? No. Yes or no? No. Oh, so this is very interesting. Do you have a dynamic mark on Andante? Yeah. Okay, and this is very interesting also. This is score reading. My edition, as I say, is, is very good. A lot of teachers probably have it. And I don't, I have legitimate, I don't have a dynamic, which kind of means that when you play this, you might want to have more liberty in the range of softs that you play. I didn't feel as though when he changes to the E major from E minor, which is, as you know, um, the parallel major, I just felt like it had to have a little bit more special, like a tear in your eye. Okay. Could you try a little of that until... Um, because I want to go over that other concept. Okay, now, so again, how many Bs do you have in the measure? Two. And then, isn't that, isn't that the same three notes that she sang? Yeah. Instead of, now, so instead of the minor third, the major, so, so the G sharp is important. Now, as you go on, so develop that without feeling a rush sense. Now, that what I wanted to bring out, because this, then the piece goes back identically, except for one little um, ornamental something. In this middle section, as you go to the next part, this sounds almost like they're dancing. And then a different color. Okay. When I get to measure 44, I split the hand. It's not written in my score, but I feel comfortable going Five, four, three, two, one, five, four, three, two. And I play the C sharp B in the left. And then soft. And then over here, I have to do it as it's written because then the left hand. When it repeats, because he was a pianist, I kind of feel that if you want to try that, you can. But as it repeats, I'd like to hear you do one other thing. When it repeats, isn't this a duet? Maybe a little of that. Okay, so look for the little different moments because, um, like we say, it, it's got such a beautiful kind of passive temperament here just for a brief moment that I feel like you could do that and then everything is back to the same. Do you want to like think about maybe doing that inner voice like that experiment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Try just for a, a one time, a little of it. Good. You have the 
idea. So then the piece repeats. And the only kind of clever thing is the next to the last measure is normal, right? Right? And then, and then the, the syncopation comes back. So those last three bars should have a sense of really showing the audience, even if you have to do the molto retard. So it just seems like it, it's a little bit off. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Good. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jamie. Bye. So long. Um, awesome. Wow. Thank you so much again for spending almost two hours of your time with us. We really, really, really appreciate it. And uh, man, I just feel like I, even for me as a, a budding piano teacher myself, I, I learned so much from what you said. And I hope that, you know, one day my students can benefit from that. And I'm sure there are so many other students who could benefit from what you've taught today. Thank you, Sherry. It's my pleasure. Yay. I love to share. And I, and I really, really thank you and Brian for establishing this and sharing with the piano community. It's wonderful. Of course. Okay. And so Congrats. what we're going to do is just uh, close out for tonight. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, thank everyone who has been uh, watching us tonight. Your support means so much to us at Piano Lake, um, especially those who have been consistently with us since April when we first started. Uh, but we also want to say as a final note that this is going to be our last masterclass for the season as we are gearing up for the upcoming Piano Star International competition, which by the way, is not too late to sign up. So please subscribe to our mailing list on our website to be the first to find out about our 2021 season. Otherwise, for more uh, Piano League content, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And that's it. So Piano Leaguers, happy practicing. And see you next time. Bye. Bye.